Oh, my, my. Thank you. Be seated. Yeah, if you can. Good night. Have you ever, how many of you have ever had the Lord and nothing else? Let me just see if I'm, yeah, ever just had the Lord and nothing else? Uh, I know in, with us, most of the time, we don't ever try to get our, <laughs> we try to stay away from that a lot of times, right? Yeah, we don't want to lose everything. We, we want a few little tricks up our sleeve and a few little rescues that we can uh, pull out at a, you know, like rabbits out of a hat to get ourselves out of a tight and a pinch. And, you know, nobody likes to lose all of their resources and uh, not have some um, prosperity going or something that can kind of help us survive in the midst of all kinds of issues of life. But what that song's about is about, hey, what about when, when it comes to the Lord's the only thing I have? When I have you and nothing else, I have everything. Yeah, yeah. That is a, that's a cry of our heart. That, that, yeah. That's a cry of the book of James, as a matter of fact. It is. And you'll get a chance to see some more of that today. Uh, should I be able to discipline myself enough to get to it? I have, um, <laughs> I have, uh, have to confess that I have been preaching the book of James for a month now. Yeah. And I've, got, I've actually gone through about uh, five or six verses and... Uh, it only has five chapters, so we, you know, maybe, maybe the first year of the millennial kingdom or something, we'll get through with the book of <laughs> James. But, but the trouble is, we're, we're living the book of James. That's the, that's the trouble. The trouble is, when I started preaching the book of James, we started living the book of James, which I'm saying to the Lord, this, that's mighty funny. You know, I mean, it's, I got you. All right, we, we got you now. Can we move on here? Because the book of James is a book about practical Christianity. Look at your neighbor and say, uh, live in your life for the Lord. Your life. Right, practical, practical. Not, just, the, not just, just theological, you know, like the mysteries of, of the incarnation and the trinity and divinity. And I mean, you know, all those are wonderful, and I'm not making fun of that. We all need to, that's a part of our life. But I'm just telling you that there are some of the, the books in the Bible that are intended to advance your understanding of, of God and yourself and Christianity. And then there are other books in the Bible, like the book of James, that is intended to inform us that we must live out the faith that we say we have or else we don't really have saving faith. We're saved by faith through grace. And I know somebody, you hear that, and you, you could repeat that. You could memorize that. I'm saved by faith through grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's a purely churchy way of talking about being saved, being, having salvation. And you could say that, but what does that mean? It means that I have believed what God has said about Christ that I have believed that Christ, according to the book of Romans, has risen from the dead. So Christ is no longer dead, that he's alive and he's living. And if I will trust him and receive him and surrender to him and wave the white flag and, you know, just give myself completely to him, then he will take me and God will save my soul and the Holy Spirit will come and live in my heart. And James says, okay, when that happens, what's your life supposed to be like? When, when, that, when, when that's completed in you, is it going to really make any difference in you? James says, if it doesn't, you don't have real faith. <laughs> uh, if something looks like it's wrong with the, your faith, it, there, it is something wrong with it. That, that's what James is basically saying, and that God, that God uh, moves us through trials in life. This is what I'm talking about, about living the book of James. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and some of you, I've said this before, and, and I know sometimes it seems funny, and we kind of chuckle about it a lot of times, and Tanya and I chuckle about it at times and laugh about it, that all through my life, it just seems like whatever I'm preaching about, I've got to live through it. It's almost like the Lord just won't let me preach something just for the fun of it, and um and not have to endure what, what is going, what's going on in whatever I'm preaching about. Well, the whole first chapter of the, of the book of James, the whole first chapter is about one single subject, really, and that is suffering as a child of God. Yeah, that you're going to suffer. 
and that you're going to go through trials that the Lord places in your life and allows in your life. And you're going to have temptations, but they're not from God. They're from the other side. They're from the evil one. And, and they are real and they are true and, and you got to deal with them. And he says something about them in these verses uh, we'll get to today. So there, in life, there are trials. In life, there are temptations. But they're two completely different things. They come from two completely different sources with two completely different purposes. James says, make no mistake about it, trials come from God. God allows trials to come into your life. Test, if you want to look at it. If, you want to, if it, that better fits, you test. And I'm not talking about examinations. Examination is a thing when the teacher tells you at the end of the week, we're going to have a test on this material, and then you go home and study this material, and when you come Friday, you have a test on the material that you've studied because she said or he said you're going to have a test on this. So you've prepared yourself. That is not a test. That is an examination. A test is what happens to you when you walk into the classroom and they pop that map up and there are questions there about what you're supposed to be keeping up daily on and it's called a pop test. That's a real test because that, 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 that lets you know, okay, I'm keeping up. Okay, I'm understanding the concept. Okay, I'm, I'm getting what I need to get every day. I just don't know how to go home and cram and get the right answers. I'm actually grasping this and, and living this out. As a matter of fact, if it doesn't happen like that, it's not a test. A test has to be something that just plops on you. You're just walking down the road, minding your own business, and all of a sudden, you fall. Have any of you ever fallen before? Yeah. Was it pretty? Have any of you ever fallen gracefully? No. I know you've tried to, right? You've tried yeah. to catch yourself, and you've tried to, you know, if, if nobody saw you, you want to dust yourself off real yeah. fast and yeah. act like, oh, yeah, whoo, that was tough. Yeah. I mean, you know, you... Yeah. You want to you wanna play it off and, 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 and make it graceful as you can, you know? Well, when you fall, you fall and you're out of control. You have no control over your fall. I know a lot of people think by, by the way they live and the way they do stuff, you would think that they believe they can fall without hurting themselves. Uh, if you've ever fallen off of a ladder or with a ladder or off of any type of height, you now have learned a valuable lesson. And that lesson is you cannot control your fall. You cannot fall without hurting yourself in some way. So a fall is something that comes upon you without preparation, without understanding. The word that James used in his verse uh, was the word parismos, which for test, which we get our word, English word pirate from. And it's just like what you would think. James says, you know what a test is? A test is like a pirate. Like out on the wide open sea, the seas are clear, the sun is shining, everything looks great, nobody around, and all of a sudden you turn back around and there's the, you know, Jolly Rogers, the sign, you know, the cross and, the cross and skull and all that. And the, and the pirates have overtaken you just that quick, unexpected, unplanned, you know, out of the blue. James says that's how tests come in our life. They just pop in on us. And when they pop in on us, we have to be prepared for this or else we as God's children will not gain the benefit of what suffering is intended to do in the life of God's children. I'm telling you, this is the major tool that God uses to grow our lives up. I'm telling you, the reason James talks about it for a whole chapter is because he wants us to understand the first thing right off the bat. If you're a child of God, let me tell you, you are going to suffer. As a matter of fact, let, let's, just, let's just read some verses. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Okay, it's a letter, and he greets them, and I've talked all about that. Look at what he says in the second verse. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various, that means multi-shaded, like a rainbow. When you fall into various trials, your trials that come in your life are not all the same. The trials that come to you are not the same trials possibly that come to me. What might try me 
might not try you at all. Whatever tests you might not test me at all. I might look at you and say, what's the problem, man? That's no big deal. But it's a real test for you. It's a real trial for you. And that's what that verse says, that God sends into our life multifaceted, multi-shaded tests that come into our life. And it's not if they come. Notice it's when they come. James says there's no question about it. If you belong to Jesus, you are going to have these tests and these trials in life. And they can be financial, they can be social, they can be mental, they can be medical, they can be spiritual. I mean, they could be almost anything that God wants to allow to flow through his love to your life in order to make you better in life. Because that's what a test is intended to do. It's like a stress test on metal. If you've ever been a part of a, of, a, of a project where they had to have a stress test on the metal in order to make sure you know, that it would be sufficient for the project, what, the reason they test the metal is not to prove it'll break. The reason they test the metal is to prove it won't break. Yeah. And so the reason for tests in our life is not to destroy us, but to prove we can't be destroyed to show us that God is in our life, that we are strong and capable, and that God is right with us, and that no matter what happens in life, uh, if I have him, I have everything. Yeah, yeah. It's intended to prove that to you yeah. so that you can gain confidence, so that you can be brave and strong and faithful, and you can be capable and able. As a matter of fact, look, look what the verse says. Uh, uh, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to live life not needing anything. In other words, you don't need somebody to come pump you up. You know God's in you. You don't need somebody to hold your hand and cry with you and, 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 and lift you up. I mean, you don't need that. You, you are lacking nothing in life. You are not a crybaby. You're not double-faced. You're not, you're, not, you know, you're, not, you're, not, you're not fragile in life. You are capable and able. You are strong and powerful with God. When bad things happen in life, it's praise the Lord, this is going to do something great in me. You got to know that. James says, he says, knowing something, yeah, yeah. not feeling something. I'm going to tell you, if you go on your feelings, let me tell you what your feelings are going to tell you. Every time something bad happens, your feelings are going to say, this is terrible. Your feelings are going to say, God doesn't love me. Your feelings are going to say, why doesn't he take me, uh, protect me? Why isn't God here? God's so far away. Oh, I'm so hurt. I'm so lost. I'm so lonely. I'm so fra I mean, that's your feelings. That's why James doesn't say feeling this. He says knowing this. You got to know something when trials come in your life. And what is it you got to know? You got to know that God's working in you and it's going to produce patience. And patience has a perfecting work in you. You're not ever going to be perfect on this side of heaven. I hate to break your bubble about that. I know some of you are planning to be, right? Well, go ahead with your plan. I hope you are. I mean, go ahead with it. Try for it. Strive for it. Yeah, we all, I mean, what are we trying to do as a Christian? We're trying to grow more like Jesus. We're trying to be more like Jesus. I mean, I'm trying to live a life that would be more pleasing to God and, and, and a better testimony to the world so that I can be a, a bright light and shine for Jesus. That's what I'm trying to do. But don't think that you're going to be perfect on this side of heaven. You're going to always be striving for it. But, but, but you'll never gain it until you get the perfection of heaven. But that doesn't keep us from, from moving that way and going that way. And it doesn't keep God from trying to help us become that way. And he says, sometimes your faith is green. It needs to be ripened. It needs to be, it needs to be uh, uh, moved on. And, and James says, it's trials that do that to you. Now, if you know that... It can help you if you know that when stuff bad start when bad stuff starts happening, you don't get blown out of the water. You can say, "Bless God, I, that's a trial for me. This is a test for me. All right, all right, man. This is going to be a great thing because I'm fixed. I'm about to grow in some area of my life. That's how I can count it all joy because I know something that God's put it in my life in order to do something great in me. And then He says, "If any of you lacks wisdom, lacks wisdom about what?" I mean, what did, what did he say? If any of you lacks wisdom, well, wisdom about what? Well, wisdom about what he just said in verse 4 about the trial you're going through. 
If any of you need to know the purpose behind it or why it's happening or what I'm supposed to do about it or how I can live through it, God, how can I make it through this? How can this be, how can this be something good in my life? How can, how can we make you know, lemonade out of lemons in this thing? God, what are we going to do? How do I need to walk? How can I cooperate with you instead of cursing my own life? How can I b- gain something out of this rather than being destroyed by this? Well, if that's you, James says, ask God. Ask God and he'll tell you. And he will tell you. And you say, how will he tell me? I'm, I'm about to tell you in just a minute. <laughs> how, he, how he's going to tell you because he, James tells you in the next few verses down exactly what he's going to do to tell you. Mm-hmm. And exactly how we're supposed to receive what he says to us. Mm-hmm. And so James says, look, ask God and God will give it to you and God won't even get on to you. God will not... Well, uh, here it says, uh, without reproach. The old King James word was, and, and, and he will not upbraid you. And that just simply means God's not going to uh, chastise you. God's not going to belittle you. God's not going to look at you and say, how, ca- how long have you been a Christian and you don't know this? Come on, man. How much does it take for you to get through? I mean, God doesn't do that. It says God is going to give to you all that you need because it's the nature of God to give. It's the nature of light to shine. It's the nature of heat to, uh, to bear heat out. I mean, you don't have to ask the sun to be hot. That's the nature of the sun, to be hot. You know, you don't have to ask light, to, hey, give me light. No, that's the nature of light, to give light. You don't have to ask God to give. It's the nature of God to give. God gives, for God so loved the world that he gave. God gives. That is the nature of God. And James says, if you need it, ask God to show you what this is all about. And he will do it. And so, in the midst of all of this testing and trial and so forth, James is wanting us to know that that when we ask, we ought to ask in faith. That means... means with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed, for let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded, man unstable in all, in all of his ways. Not just his spiritual ways, not just his social ways, but in all of his ways. A double-minded person. A person, that, a person that tries to weigh both ends of the scale and decide which one's best. A person who really asks, saying, have you ever asked God, to bless your life or to use your life or to move you forward in life or to stop something that's going on in life and then God spoke to you about it and, and, and then you said, well, mm, that's good, God, but I, I, I like my way better. <laughs> I mean, you're asking God knowing that you have a way and you're trying to say, okay, well, let's see what God wants to do and then I'm going to see what I want to do and then I'll decide which one I want to do. We do that all the time. If we like God's answer, we'll go with God's answer. But if we don't, we've got one still left. That, James says that's double-minded. James says you can't pray and ask God. If you're going to pray and ask God to show you what this trial is all about, you're going to have to pray believing. You're going to have to pray with faith. You're going to have to pray with boldness, with encouragement, with strength. You're going to... You, it can't be one of these little, one of these little halfway, half-hearted kind of little prayers, like, "Oh God, I hope and and I wish it would be so." And God, oh, I'm so worried about it. Baby. Can't be like that. It's got to be God. You're going to do something great in my life. I just need to know. Give me wisdom about this, and know that God is going to do this. See, this is how you can count it all joy when trials come in your life, because you know what I'm saying to you. You know that this is something that God's going to use to better your life. You know it's going to be something greater for you. You know this is going to end up being a positive thing in your life and not a negative thing. No matter how dark it might look, no matter how unpleasant it might be, because I didn't say everything that is good is pleasant. There are lots of things that are, that are good that are very unpleasant. And don't think God won't pop some of that out. A lot of it is unpleasant, but it's not sinful. It's unpleasant. You don't like it, but it's intended to do you good. One of the things that my parents, man, my mom was a nurse, and I'm going to tell you what, everything that happened to us as a child, mom had one cure for it. You know what it was? Yeah, castor oil. That's right, Deborah. Your mom and my mom went to the same school, didn't they? Yeah. I don't care. I don't care. 
I don't care what it was, castor oil would fix it right up. That's right. That's and that was the most unpleasant stuff that you have ever gotten a hold. Do they? Can you even get a hold of castor oil today? Yeah. All right, look, let me tell you something. You want to edify yourself? You want to build yourself up? Go get some castor oil. After church today, stop at a drugstore or whatever and get you some castor oil and then go out to your car and you just take a little swig of it. And you will be taking a swig of the most unpleasant thing that you have ever put in your mouth in your entire lifetime. But it'll do you good. It'll, do you. it'll fix what ails you. Hey, your stomach's hurting here. Here's some castor oil. Oh, no, mom, boy, that's good. Right? Hey, whoo, boy, that stomach just cleared right up. I mean, it would cure anything. So God says, look, I got to ask. I got to ask with confidence. I got to ask. Look, I can count it all joy because I know that when I ask, God's going to help me with this. God's going to give me wisdom about this. This is going to make sense to me. This is going to strengthen me. This is going to be an encouragement in my life, and I know that, so I can count it all joy. Now, if I don't know that, then I'm going to be sad, and I'm going to be pouting, and I'm going to be anxious, and I'm going to be in turmoil, and I'm going to be, why does God do this to me? And my, oh, my life, and all these other people, they love the Lord. Nothing ever happens to them. That's the way we'll be in life. Just being tossed to and fro, just like, like, like one, some of these little white caps out here in the Gulf. You know, just wind blowing and blow it that way and blow it that way and blow it. And I mean, that's you. That's just scattered all over the place. Crying, trembling, anxious, pitiful, no strength, no focus, no mission, no purpose. Can't depend on you. Nobody can trust you. Because it just depends on how, what you feel when you wake up as to what you do in life. You are unstable in all, in your money, in your children, in your spirit, in your work, in your neighborhood. You are unstable in all of your ways. You say, what's wrong with me? Well, you're, you're double-minded. And James says, you can't be like that. So what he's doing here now, I don't want us to miss the flow. What he's doing in this whole chapter is he's saying, tests come from God and they're intended to do you good. Temptation comes from the evil one and they're intended to bring you down. And you got to know the difference between the two. And if you'll know the difference between the two, it'll bless you because you will understand that God gives only good things and, and, and you can trust God and you can count it joy when these things start coming into your life because it had to be filtered through the love of God. And if it got filtered through the love of God, God will not allow anything to come in your life that, wasn't, that couldn't be a blessing in your life and couldn't strengthen you and couldn't go. So if God has allowed it, it must be good. You got to believe that. You got to know that. And that's what, that's what God said. Now look at this. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. And that was the twin test. And if you hadn't filled that out in your paper, in your outline, that was the twin test of poverty and plenty. And I'm not going to go back through all that. I'm just going to say this. There are two big trials in life that every one of us fall into, at least one of. You fall into either the trial of poverty or the trial of plenty. Now, there may be somebody in here or several of you that might have fallen into both of them. You know, <laughs> I don't know. But the trial of poverty is let the brother, let the lowly brother, that means the brother that's crushed. That means the brother who's fallen on hard times. That means the brother who has, who, whose life has become so terrible that he has lost all of his self-esteem. He's lost all feelings about himself. He feels like the lowest rung on the totem pole. He feels like when he walks into the room, nobody cares. Nobody sees him. Nobody smiles. Nobody goes over and starts talking to him. He's forgotten. He's overlooked. He's not necessary. James says, if that's you, if you are the brother of low degree, let me tell you something. You got something to be exalted by. You know what you've got to be exalted by? There's something living on the inside of you that'll never die. There's something living on the inside of you that is riches and wonderful and glorious and majestic. It is the Spirit of God living on the inside of you that's going to take you somewhere when all of this world comes to an end. And believe me, it is all coming to an end. One of these days is going to be goodbye world, goodbye by. And you're going to go and you're going to enjoy the riches of heaven because you've been washed in the blood and filled with the spirit and made part of the brotherhood, beloved in the kingdom of God. I mean, these are great things about your life. So rejoice in the fact that God lives on the inside of you and you're the son of a king. That's what the lowly brother be exalted in this fact means. 
You got something more than, than, than that poverty you're living in. And you can be encouraged by that, and you can be strengthened by that, and you can, and you can be, you, that can make you happy. When you're feeling low and you feel like you're at the lowest point of your life, you just think about what a great kingdom you're a part of. And what a majestic father you have. And what royal brothers and sisters you have. You're not a nobody. You're a somebody. Because of who you are and whose you are. You belong to a king, man. And then he said, let the rich people, which is the trial of plenty. This is the trial where you have everything you want. And make no mistake, that is a trial. If you don't believe it, you look at some of these jokers that have everything they want. And what are they doing? They're destroying themselves. They're killing themselves. They are pitiful. They, you know, they, they, they go bankrupt. They go belly up. They can't trust people around them. They don't know if somebody's there who loves them or whether there's somebody trying to get something from them. I, I mean, they can't live life in, 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 in normal ways. <coughs> Jerry Clower, I know many of us, we Mississippians remember Jerry Clower. I don't know if you folks from Chicago, Bev and Lawrence, will remember Jerry Clower. Jerry Clower was one of our great comedians. He's going to be with the Lord now. But, but Jerry Clower was a, was a full-time fertilizer salesman that before he was a comedian. And he made $50 a week. And he said this. He made this comment. He said, nothing so tests your Christianity like prosperity. He says, it's, not, it, it, it's easy to tithe when you make $50 a week as a fertilizer salesman. But when you make $50,000 a night, it's, it becomes a lot more difficult. He said, it's real easy to be pious, to be godly, to be, uh, you know, to appear to be spiritual and godly when you don't have anything. Yeah, but when you have something, buddy, it gets really difficult. And if you don't believe it, listen to the testimony that Wesley shared about that mission trip where they went up into Canada and went to the very richest of the rich of the rich and had vacation Bible school, and, and how the parents acted. The parents came down there when the little kids had the graduation from vacation Bible school and acted like it was a nuisance. It was an imposition. It was a, you know, you, you hurry up and let's get this over with. It's in my way. You know, I got bridge tonight, or I got to, you know, got to go to the club. Or I mean, they have everything they want. They don't need anything. So how do you reach them? Well, James says that, the rich person should be brought low, should be brought down to real earth, really, by the fact that it is, that, that, that it is not his riches and it is not his success and it is not his business that has made him the successful person he is, but it is that Jesus Christ lives on the inside of him and, he, and, and, and the rich person needs Jesus just as much as the poorest person on the face of this earth. That you cannot exalt yourself in the fact that you have everything and business is everything because that's not what is important in life. What is important in life is that I've identified myself with a humble, lowly, poverty-ridden group of people that have Jesus living in their heart and that he is the most valuable thing in the world. And so you rich people, he said, you better get, grit, you better get a grasp on that. And then he gives an illustration. I mean, you, you can see it in the verse. But the rich, uh, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, uh, but the rich in his humiliation because, now here's what he says, because you need to understand that, that prosperity is like a, a flower of the field, that your prosperity can pass away, boom, just like that. And he says, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers uh, the grass, it flowers, falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in all of his pursuits. In other words, look, your prosperity is as fickle as, as a flower of the field with the sun shining on it, and you pick the thing off. It's got beautiful petals, beautiful stem, and, and you hold it there, and the sunlight shines down on it, and in just a little while, the petals begin to wilt, the stem begins to wilt, the flowers fall off, and before you know it, you're just sitting there looking at a stem. And so prosperity, James says, prosperity is something that once you start to admire it, it, it vanishes before you know it. You can't trust in your prosperity. You can't trust in your riches. Y'all got to trust in Christ. And so the, poverty, uh, the trial of poverty and the trial of plenty are both real tests in life. And he goes on to say, blessed is the man who endures testing. So whether you have 
Whether you're in the prosperity of life or the poverty of life, testing is going to be a real test for you, whichever one you're in. And if you will endure that testing, God's got something for you in, on this earth and in the world to come. Blessed is the man who endures testing for when he's been approved, when he's passed the test, when he's lived through it, when he's on the other side of it, he'll receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So you'll be blessed here and blessed there if you can endure. And then it's almost like somebody interrupts James. He's like preaching this sermon like, like I am. And it would be like somebody would stand up in the back and say, well, pastor, pastor, hang on. Wait, wait I, got, I, got, I got a little observation for you, pastor. Uh, look, I, I'm not being tested by God. I'm being tempted by God. And James say, oh, buddy, don't say that. That is not the truth. That is absolutely the exact opposite of the truth. And don't you ever say something like that. Because God cannot be tempted with evil. So therefore, God does not use evil to tempt us with. It would be foreign to, of the nature, foreign to the nature of God for God to use evil to tempt us with evil because God cannot be tempted with evil, and he won't even be tempted to tempt us with evil, is literally what James is saying. This is far, in other words, this is so far from the nature of God, it's ridiculous. So he's still on his text now. He's still on his point. His point is that trials and temptations are two different things, and if you get them mixed up, you're going to get messed up. You've got to keep them separated, because if you keep them separated, you can, you can know something about trials, and it can help you when you go into one. You can count it all joy. So he says, all right, he says, uh, okay, brother, okay, brother, you say, you say God's tempting you. Let me talk to you about temptation. He says, here's what temptation is, but each one is tempted now, the older King James says, but every man, every man is tempted. Every man. Look at me say, every man. That means all of us, right? That, it didn't just say the black man or the white man or the young man or the old man. Um, excuse me, Bill. <laughs> you out of here. <laughs> if Brian was here, I would have pointed at him. Right. Older. Or, or, or a woman or a man or, or a, a gender. I mean, he says every one of us, every man is tempted. Jesus was tempted, man. He was taken into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil said, you know, here the kingdom of the world fall down and worship me. And, he, you know, here's the turn these stones into bread. And, and, I mean, Jesus was tempted. Every one of us are tempted. And he said, here's what temptation is. When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Now, the old King James word was drawn away by his own lust. But, I, you know, people think sex when they hear lust. They don't think you lust for money, you lust for pride, you lust for ambition, you lust for popularity. I mean, lust is just a word that describes a craving inside of you. And James says, you know what temptation is? Temptation is when this intense craving inside of you for whatever it is becomes so powerful that it begins to entice you. And the picture that he's painting for us here is the picture of a fisherman that throws a lure out into the water. And that lure is designed to be perfectly suited to capture the attention of the fish who it looks like something that he, he desires, that he craves. And then that fisherman works that lure, you know, pulls it, lets it drop, or pulls it across, spinning across the top, or makes it flutter. I mean, that fisherman who is an excellent fisherman knows how to pull that lure just in certain ways so that fish will be enticed. That fish will say, oh, man, I've been waiting for that all my life. Oh, this is going to be wonderful, boy. I don't know how I could have been this lucky this day, boy. I've been waiting for that. And then the fish goes, ah! And grasp that thing, and then he reels him in. He's got him. That's what James says temptation is. 
Temptation is when the enemy takes advantage of you by knowing your weakness and knowing what you lust after and knowing what will entice you. And when he throws that lure out there and you're looking at it and he's making it look so pretty and so nice and so good that finally you just say, I just can't help it. And you bite at it and and then he reels you in. That's temptation. And you end up in a pot of hot grease before it's all over with. That's what temptation, James says, that's temptation. A test from God does not lure you out and end you up in a pot of hot grease. A test from God draws you to him, brings you strength, lets you know you're for real, does great things in your life. So don't be calling a test from God a temptation because God doesn't do stuff like that. He said, but temptation is real and it comes from the enemy when he finds your weak point and then he uses it to exploit you. And then he says, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings death. We used to talk about it in the church when I was young people, LSD. I mean, I know it's an illicit drug and so forth, and it's probably making a comeback, but, but LSD was a drug that was very new back then in the 60s, and, and it was the kind of just something that, that crazy people experimented with. But we had our own LSD, and it was right there, lust, sin, and death. Lust, when it conceives, brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. There's the original LSD right there. James says, you know what? Lust and enticement got together, and lust conceived, and lust had a baby. And that baby's name is sin. And then sin started growing, And by the time sin was full grown, he was a serial killer. That's what James says about temptation in life. And so he's drawing the distinction between now what God does in our life and what the enemy does in our life. So that as Christians, we won't be crying saying, God doesn't love me and God doesn't care about me. And where's God? And why didn't God stop this? And why couldn't God do something about this? Man, I'm telling you, your life is going to be filled with trials. Not if, when. It's filled with them right now. My life is filled with them right now. Because God is, is, is maturing me. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. I, I don't know if you noticed this, but once, when James starts to get heavy on them and he starts to kind of hammer them, he, I, it's like he's looking out at them and he's seeing them go, you know, and, and then he'll call them, then he'll say, blood, brother, blood, brethren. He'll, he'll, he'll lighten it a little bit. He'll say, oh, you, I love you. I love you. You know, you've had somebody say, man, let, I love you, but <laughs> I love you. When somebody says, hey, when somebody says, I love you, but you know one thing's about to happen, right? They, they fix to do something that's not loving, right? All right, because they had, I mean, they, I love you, but, all right, that means I'm fixing to do something that's not going to prove I love you. I mean, uh, all right. Not going to seem like I love you anyway. All right, do not be, so, so get this straight, he says. All right, let me say it one more time. I'm, 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 I'm thinking for James right now. And he's saying, all right, get this straight and don't let it get messed up in your mind. I, I, I want you to understand this. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. He says, M- know that, that if it comes from God, it is good. It is exclusively good. God cannot give bad stuff. God can only give good stuff. Know that. If you know that, then when your trial comes from him, you can be joyful about that because you can say, God, let this pass through so it's a good thing. It might be unpleasant, but it's still good. Because God has only good things. Look at it. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights 
comes cascading down through eternity like a light shaft down to us is what he's saying. He said, it's coming down like just like, like shafts of light coming down upon you. And, 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 and he says, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, not even one degree of evil is coming from God. Not even one little hint of a shadow. The love of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the best of God is coming down like shafts out of heaven and light upon you and there's not even one degree of shadow in anything that God does. God is not fickle. God is not two-faced. God is not trying to stab you in the back and come in the back door. Good things come from God. James says, you've got to know this. See, this is what you know. You know, I said, how can you count it all joy? You have to know something. Well, what is this is what you need to know. And if you know this, then you can count it joy when something, when trial pops, when those pirates pop up in your life. Because you know it's from God. Of his own, look, look, of his own will, he brought us forth. In other words, God saw a time for you and a purpose for you. And by his will, you're not an accident. You're not a happenstance. Your mom and dad might not have planned you, but God planned you. That's why you're here. You are a gift from God. Of his own will, he brought you forth. In other words, God birthed you on this earth so that you could serve a purpose. And he placed inside of you a seed of his purpose when you were a baby and, that, and he's been watering that seed, and he's been feeding that seed, and that seed's been growing inside of you, and now you're at the point where that seed has produced a full-grown plant, and that plant's ready to bear some fruit. And you know what that fruit is? The fruit is the image of the glory of Christ. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, God brought us out here so we could be an example to everything. So that we could be the the most noticeable. So that that, that we could have dominion and we could have uh, influence and we could have uh, 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 some some, uh, movement in life where we could impress people that they might follow us. We're kind of a first fruit. And, And you'll know this if you'll ask God Ask God. If, if, you, if you need wisdom, ask God. This is the kind of stuff God will tell you. And so James says, you can know the truth. And how can we know this? Well, he says it to us right in the middle of that verse. How is God going to tell you? You ask him for his will. You ask him about his purpose. You seek wisdom from him. You have said, God, give me wisdom. God, give me the answer. God, give me truth. How is God going to give it to you? James says, by the word of truth. What is the word of truth? The word of truth is the, is the word of God. If, we, if, if this was, you know, 10 years ago or so, I'd be saying it, the word of truth. It, well, here's one. This, this, this is the word of truth right here. <laughs> that is the word of truth. That, that's a Bible. I know. Hey, look. Look at it. Good. Some of you have never seen one. This is a Bible <laughs> right here. You've seen it on your phone, you know, but you've never seen that. That's the word of truth. And what he says is, I'm going to talk to you by the word of truth. So we're to receive from God his understanding about what we're going through, and we're going to receive it through the word of truth because it's the word of truth that tells us how to behave. It's the word of truth that tells us how to respond to life. It's the word of truth that tells us what we need to do to please God and impress God and what God's going to do in our life. It's the word of truth that is the guidance of our life. So how do we receive the word of truth? I got five adverbs for you. You know what an adverb is? It's a modifier, right? Usually modifies a verb or an adverb. Like, like, 
I am to receive the word, and the next word I might use would be an adverb. It's modifying how I receive. I got five of them, and they're in the next three verses, but I don't have time. So y'all going to have to lock down today, and I'll get with them. Well, so far, you know, 18 verses. Let me, let me say, hey, good. good. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Move right along. I mean, hey, but these next, these next verses, 19, 20, and 21, give you five, five adverbs about how to receive the word of truth. And they're, they're for real, man. I mean, seriously. So we'll look at them next week, all right? Y'all coming back? All right. You know, you know whenever I was preaching on, in years past I, I, in, in traditional church, we had a Sunday morning service, a, a Sunday night service, and a Wednesday night service. And I would preach in all three of them. And uh, so on Sunday morning, I would kind of, a lot of times, I would try to stop at a certain point to give them, you know, make them come back tonight to hear what the answer was or the rest of that stuff was, kind of like that creative marketing kind of stuff. <laughs> but, uh, but, I'm t- <laughs> but I'm telling you, I'm not doing that to you guys, all right? I really, I don't know. I, I, it's, God bless us, that's all I can say. All right. God bless us. All right, stand to you. Stand to your feet. Yeah.